I'm Cheyenne Turner, and I'm going to be the moderator for the research, researchers involved with the abductions. And I would like to explain just a little bit of how I got involved with some of this field. I was um, president of a group in Dallas, the MUFON Metroplex, for about four years. And I would get many, many calls from abductees who were in a great deal of pain, didn't know who to go to, and just needed someone, you know, to hear their story. And that's how I originally met Carla. And I remember when um, she and her husband were sitting in my living room giving me their story, and uh, obviously in a great deal of distress. And I helped them find someone to go to to um, do the, you know, the hypnosis and regressions. And I know that um, the researchers really give a great deal of their time and effort, and I think they're really to be commended because um, it takes a lot of understanding. And I think that we all owe them a great deal of thanks. <clears throat> what they're going to be doing is introducing themselves, giving a little bit of their background and what their research involves. So we will start uh, on this end with Forrest Crawford. I made Linda sit in the middle so she'd get all the attention too. I talked a lot about symbol stuff earlier, so you know that I like controversial correlations or correlations in general. But what may not have been evident is that I'm very involved in abduction research as well and uh, have a, a training as a hypnotherapist, extensive background in ufology, so to speak. I've been doing it for a long time. That's kind of what I bring to the abduction research phenomenon and have worked with abductees essentially in the St. Louis area, but uh, uh, all over the country as well. And uh, a lot of the information that I present comes from their experiences. In fact, almost all of it does, except for when I tell you it's something weird that happened to me. Uh, <laughs> and it comes from their experiences and the correlations that come out of that work and the communications in there. So uh, uh, I rely heavily on my relationship with, with the abduction and uh, contact uh, uh, experiencers, if you will, uh, that I work with, because they're the ones that are bringing the pieces together. We're just kind of helping them realize that. That's kind of the way I feel. Well, it was the animal mutilations that led me to human abductions. The two, I think, are related uh, in relationship to the phenomenon's intrusion on the planet. And um, I've never been actively involved in terms of the therapy side uh, or the hypnosis side, but what happened is that because I was doing programs that were relating to the subject matter, I began to be a lightning rod for people sending me audio cassettes and letters, and at this point it seems like hundreds of drawings, um, because they wanted to be able to share something with someone that they felt that they could at least, uh, I guess, and whether it was anonymously or uh, giving me their name and their number, sharing experiences. And now, uh, over time, it seems that what has been valuable from my point of view in research is that totally apart from hypnosis, I have been seeing these patterns that are emerging from dozens and dozens and dozens of people from all over the United States. Uh, some are also coming from South America and I'm seeing the same drawings from people who don't know each other and live on two different coasts and I, th I hope that there is some value, value in contributing uh, these patterns in this uh, evolving alien taxonomy uh, that I am uh, trying to continue to gather uh, because it may be that there are, might be screen memories as some people suggest and that the menagerie might be something that's testing us. On the other hand, Occam's razor would suggest that if you go for the simplest possible uh, answer or reason for why there is this pattern of uh, similar descriptions, it's because there are actually different, whatever they are, uh, involved in various people's lives. And that is an area of research that, um, that provokes me in this huge phenomenon that includes many facets as we've been discussing the last two days. 
My name is John Carpenter, and I have the position in the Mutual UFO Network of uh, Director of Abduction Research. Uh, it's, I was just thinking here, it's real interesting, five years ago I came as a naive um, listener and was learning from people like Linda uh, about what all was going on. And today it felt more like a family reunion. Uh, I knew everybody up here that spoke today. They all knew me, and I knew so many people out there in the audience. So uh, this is becoming less of a conference and more of a reunion uh, every year. Uh, anyway, I got into all of this because I volunteered. And uh, uh, I thought it would be interesting if one day I might get to sit in on one case and uh, uh, it kind of went uh, the other way. Um, I have a lot of people that sit in on my sessions, <laughs> which are, are now probably uh, oh, s several hundred. Um, I work in Springfield as a licensed clinical social worker and had training in hypnosis. And um, it's been a real interesting journey. Uh, like everyone has said today, we don't know where all it's going, but I'm in it now for the ride and I'm fascinated with everything that comes up. Um, and part of my position now is to try to get other mental health professionals helping and helping in the right way because there's obviously, as you've heard here today, a real need and we don't want just anybody, you know, trying to take this on and, and, and providing the help because it's a, it's a special kind of help, as you've heard from the, uh, as I will call them, participants in this odyssey that were up here a few minutes ago. Uh, they need a special kind of understanding. This is such a unique and bizarre phenomenon. And you just can't go in a 50-minute hour with some psychologist and expect to unravel it all. And it's just, it just requires, you know, many hours. Uh, last weekend when I was with John in Atlanta and, Bud, and uh, David Jacobs and, and we were talking about even what Bud Hopkins does and we all spend like uh, three to four hours each time we meet with somebody because it just requires that much support and, and, and just effort uh, and the hypnosis uh, just to go carefully and do everything right. And, and so it's real important that other professionals just don't jump in thinking, oh, this is something new and interesting, and I'll just fit it into my little schedule. It doesn't work that way. Um, so I, I think that uh, as we've been doing the, the conferences, it came out of the Roper Report in taking roughly 100 mental health professionals at a time around the country and really trying to give them the best information, the best ideas of how to help. Ironically, I think a lot of those professionals that show up are showing up because they've already had experiences. Um, they've told us that a lot of times. So, uh, you know, the numbers in the Roper Poll are probably exactly right, and, and as we were saying, uh, perhaps uh, very conservative numbers. Uh, so obviously there's a need out there, and I find myself really trying to help. I get calls from California and Minnesota and Florida all in one night. Uh, which is hard when my four-year-old is tugging on my leg and wanting me to go play a game with him. Uh, so it's, it's been a real challenge, but uh, there's no way I'm going to quit. There's no way I'm going to stop. Uh, it, it has to be seen through all the way, wherever we're going, and uh, so I'm in it. Yeah, uh, I'm John Mack. I won't um, uh, burden you with another speech. Uh, I, uh, I guess the what I cannot resist saying is how profoundly entering this field uh, changes everything in your life. Um, personal, uh, professional, uh, your energy systems. Um, I, and one of the things I want to mention, John uh, talked about the fact that you need to set aside three or four hours. Well, there's a big economic aspect of this. Uh, most psychiatrists are set up, or other mental health professionals, to do one hour. The reimbursement structure only reimburses for one hour and uh, people just can't afford this and I, I think one of the things this is forcing us to do is to examine the rather rigid structure of the mental health professions with regard to therapy and treatment. Uh, if you were um, you know, to do a 45 minute hypnosis session or a whole session you've only left 50 minutes it's a little bit like a surgeon uh, uh, who goes in to uh, do a uh, 
resection of a piece of the bowel and gets uh, gets it out and it looks as watch as well as 50 minutes there's no time for sewing up here we'll just leave the person with the abdomen open and uh, uh, you know leave I mean it, it, that's it, it has pointed out the uh, the way in which our profession is structured not according to human need but according to the convenience of the therapist and I think that uh, has to be looked at differently. The other thing that it's changed for me is the whole notion that there is such a thing as an expert who knows something and then this person who has this problem. That's all changing. Uh, working with abductees is totally non-hierarchical. They know something and if I can help facilitate that knowledge and learn from that and be of use then that's uh, what happens, but that's not the model of the old doctor-patient hierarchical model. So it's forcing me to totally re-examine the whole model of how I do treatment and therapy, uh, not just in this area, but how our profession is structured. So it, I think this this work has the possibility of uh, radically uh, uh, showing us ways of reforming and restructuring how we do uh, support, counseling, therapy, whatever you want to call it, in the, in the mental health professions. Well, before I say anything, I'd like to say that it's wonderful to have an end to the old patient-doctor hierarchy. I think I can speak for many patients out there. So thank you. I'm Carla Turner. I think I may be the only one on this uh, stage who came into this research because of the experiences my family and I were going through. And like Cheyenne said, we did get to someone who gave us extremely valuable help when we needed it. And I also want to say thank you to the folks who are trying to educate our mental health professionals because I did turn to those in the community where we lived, every single one of them. None of them would work with us it was something that they would be laughed out of the profession for doing and I hope that you can reach all of these people and I want to give you a specific name and address to include on your next <laughs> list. <clears throat> this being the case where we were and for a lot of people where you are we had to turn to each other to other people in this predicament for help and found some excellent help I will not say we had to settle for it I think we were lucky to get it but in the course of working through what my family and I had been through, I developed an association with the researcher working with us and became as much of an assistant as I could in her research and have continued to do that to this day. I am not the primary hypnotist, believe me, but I make sure the people who want regression, who ask for regression, do have someone that they can go to that I trust with my life and with my children. Um, I wouldn't recommend anyone that I didn't have very good recommendations from people they had already worked with, and I think that's important for any of you to know about. Secondly, it being a backdoor researcher and a front door abductee, I'm in a very different position from a lot of the researchers because I have a very personal stake in how the research goes. And therefore, perhaps some of my feelings are going to be a little bit different than the others that you will have heard or will hear. I do find that I can sit outside as the abductee and look at the researchers as you guys and say, why are you guys doing this or doing that? And why aren't you doing this or doing that? And then on the other hand, other abductees or experiencers who come to us put me in the position of the researcher trying to make sense. They want some answers, some solutions, some explanations. And I'm back on the other side of the fence here, so I can sympathize from both ways. And, and I can tell you, in my opinion, on both sides of the fence, the researchers need to get their acts together a little bit better on some things. There is too much uh, jealousy. There is too much hoarding of information. And while researchers fight over these things, abductees go on going through these experiences not getting anywhere. So I think we've got to have to clean the whole act up a bit. Secondly, on the, uh, the side of whether, which we've heard raised here the past two days, the question of good aliens, bad aliens, good experiences, bad experiences, good abductees, bad abductees, and it's come to that in many cases. From the research that the, the researcher I work with is Barbara Barthlett, from the research of well into the hundreds of cases, approximately 500, including those that I have worked with and have brought uh, research and investigative material into the fund from, we see that you cannot say 
if you're going to be true to the data, you cannot say that a person's experiences when they have an encounter reflect that person's inner being, that person's uh, moral strength or lack of it, that person's spiritual evolution or lack of it, because as Leah pointed out, the same person can have a positive experience one time and a negative one the next time, and this is the same person. So there is an objective reality that is different in some experiences from others, no matter who's experiencing them. And if I had to stake anything right now, which is a bad thing to do, to put money on the table on any answers to these questions right now, the things I would feel strongest on putting money on are that there are a variety of alien types. Although we have many cases where two or more types are involved in a person's abduction as if they're working together, we don't know what that means, but we know that some of the experiences are so intrinsically different that there seem to be many agendas, not just one. So you can't put a good label or bad label on the entirety when you have diverse things that are not in the same pot. I think the one thing we, the research shows is that there are many things going on that don't fit the patterns that are nice, neat patterns. If you look at just what one group is doing, you're going to get some patterns. If you pull in what's happening to everybody, you're going to get some things that won't fit in any category or any pattern. So looking for neat answers, I think, is a limiting way to approach it from what the people we've worked with have experienced. And trying to put everything into one pot is defeating because you're not going to get everything in there without chopping off somebody's arms or legs or other experience that doesn't fit the mold. Um, other than that, I'm open for questions with the rest of them. Okay, thank you. We're now going to open the floor for questions. Uh, if you'd like to come up to the microphone and um, present your question. And do try to make them as brief as possible. Mm -hmm. I guess this will be for anybody. Um, a lot of the speakers have said something about the environmental damage that we're doing to the planet and how the aliens feel about that. And I'd like to get some more feedback on that. Thank you. It's not that the aliens, you know, always tell them consciously, you know, uh, you need to clean this up or do this. It, it, it's interesting. I, it seems like there's an effect that definitely takes place. So many people have had these experiences are, are so much more in tune with, with uh, nature. Uh, Jean, who you heard up here, uh, Jean Robinson, uh, when I was working with her, uh, soon after some of her first recollections that she was having these experiences, she saw a uh, turtle crossing the road and she was just kind of watching it and, and marveling at it and, and with new eyes, so to speak, with new eyes. And here came a car down the road and instead of swerving to miss it, it swerved to hit the turtle and it just tore her up that that had happened. And she'd never reacted that way before. And with so many people who have been through this experience, there is such a, a keen um, um, phenomenon that happens that tune them into nature. I don't know wh where exactly it comes from, whether it's like directly told to them or it's just part of the experience or what, but there is definitely a phenomenon there. Um, so it's hard to answer in terms of whether they're told anything specifically to do. There's just an awareness that occurs. One thing that I've noticed is that there will be a little bit like the time release capsules. Two weeks ago, within a four hour period at night, I had a phone call from four different abductees. And each one of them, there was uh, one in Oregon, there was one in New Jersey, there was one in Pennsylvania, um, I think the other one was in Maryland. E each one was just calling independently to say, Linda, Last night, I had, the only way I could describe it was a virtual reality dream. Um, and uh, Debbie, uh, the Kathy Davis carried Debbie Tomey um, in Illinois. She was also, I talked with her about that time. Well, I had not heard the term from an abductee about having a virtual reality dream before, uh, a couple of weeks ago, in one night, four people calling me. 
And the way that they were explaining it, one woman said, it's like I'm inside of a Nintendo game, three-dimensional in color. Only the content and the subject matter of what they were describing all had to do with earthquakes, volcanoes, and high winds. Um, the first time that I had heard about the high wind uh, dreams was in 1989. Then there were more people in 1990 who were saying they were uh, having dreams, not vivid dreams, or not this three-dimensional color feeling, but they were having dreams about seeing the planet being swept with increasingly higher, higher winds, uh, worse storms. Uh, the volcanoes have already, already always been there in the earthquakes. Well, over this e evolution of the years when you suddenly would get on a night or two nights this pattern of abductees calling from all over the country, I began to wonder about this, this release of information and these changes. There have been lots of arguments about whether the so-called screens that abductees have been presented about seeing the earth going through some kind of huge cataclysm. Was this a test or is this something being shown in the future? Regardless of what is the truth or not the truth, there is a fact that abductees are around the country at certain times seem to get releases in dreams or vivid dreams, or now they're saying virtual reality dreams as if it's taking on a whole new character right now, just suddenly. And every time that there is this new agitation among the abductees that I know and stay in touch with me, there always seems to be, the, bo the d common denominator has to do with something having to do with the planet Earth. Um, where this is going to head and lead, I don't know, but something seems to work at some subconscious level or other level uh, on many people at once. I just wanted to add a little bit to uh, what John was saying also, that many of the experiencers um, develop sensitivities to a multitude of different kinds of energies and natural phenomenon as well because of their experience which which goes along with what uh, John was saying about their attunement to the planet becomes very sharp they can sense earthquakes coming days to, to weeks sometimes in advance um, they can feel shifts in in uh, weather or other conditions in advance uh, or they can tell when things are, are slightly awry and their, their attunement to the the workings and patterns of nature seems to be heightened in some way. We've even tested some of these energy abilities, at least in a rudimentary sense, um, uh, and shows that they can easily detect extreme magnetic fields and changes in those, or another phenomenon that uh, deals with stress in materials called tensor fields that, uh, that can also be tested, and we, there's more work needs to be done in this area to really quantify it scientifically, but early indications are that uh, that uh, they become very sensitive to different kinds of energies and, and are, are affected emotionally by changes that are going on to the earth. And they, they, this may contribute to this growing concern that they have that the planet is about to tip on its side and everything's going to go crazy. So it's kind of hard to tell uh, if they're just really feeling more in tune with things or if these predictions that we keep hearing are, are really have some substance. Anyone else have a comment on the panel? Is that it? Any other questions from the audience? This might be a short evening. You, okay. Uh, I'm interested in the, uh, the state of, of mind or state of consciousness, or, or maybe you should say altered state of consciousness, uh, prior, immediately prior to, during, and immediately after an abduction experience. Uh, Linda may have touched on an aspect of it with the dreams. The and maybe I should be asking this to the uh, abductees themselves. And if if uh, you have if if you can answer the question, I wish you would. If the panelists can't, um, the accounts that I have read when I read them, I get the idea or the impression of a dream, a dream state, or at least my dream states. Um, and, and the particular curious thing is 
which is like my dream states, I don't think the ridiculous things in my dreams are ridiculous until I wake up and become and think about them in, with my conscious mind. And, and, I, and I get this from, that this is possibly the case, seems to be the case in the abduction experience. And uh, I would just like for someone to, to talk about that uh, some, either you all or the actual. Yeah, uh, I'd like to start it and then uh, see who wants to jump in. Um, in the West, we have a very limited number of words for different states of consciousness. In the Eastern thinking and religion, there may be 50, 80, 100 words for, for the different possible states. We have uh, conscious, unconscious, dream, sleep, and we have hypnagogic states, which means the state when you're falling asleep, and hypnopompic when you're waking up, and that sort of in-between state. And that's about it. Oh, I guess you can have uh, stupor if you're, you know. Uh, <laughs> we, 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 we really are very limited in what we know. Now, this phenomenon forces us to think about subtleties. And, you know, we don't like to think about subtleties. Uh, so, 90... Yeah, numbers. A uh, high percentage of people will remember until they've had a chance uh, to explore th their abductions as dreams. Okay? Now, when they call it a dream, is it a dream that recollects an abduction? Is it an abduction they're calling a dream? There's all kinds of ways the word dream is used. It was just an experience that happens at night. You call it a dream because that's the way you were raised to think. What uh, I mentioned this afternoon, and I want to stress it, uh, if you take a, an abduction experiencer through the night of an experience, uh, there is that moment of truth when they realize they weren't really asleep when this happened. Now, there's a sort of, like, you went to bed, you, and it's very important to go, you know, reconstruct the events of the night. Like, okay, what time did you go to bed? And you're watching television, and you went to bed, and then what happened, and, 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 and then this light came in. Now, but you didn't say you fell asleep, and that's a moment of truth. And at that moment, a shift in consciousness occurs. It's not as if they're just like an ordinary waking consciousness. Uh, uh, one of the people that Bud and I have worked with in, in New York describes, it's as if the uh, aliens come through a screen. They break through, uh, it's like a scrim, which is the, the screen in the theater. In, it's as if they shatter one reality and come into this reality. The person's not asleep, but they're in another state of consciousness, but they're fully present in that state of consciousness, but it's a different state of consciousness. So it's a true experience, but in another state of consciousness. And we don't have language for that. So that's just a starter. For, but this is a very important and very interesting subject, a very good question. Um, Clark, I'd like to say something, having had the experience and have also having worked with and listened to many, many other people with the experience. In one instance, <clears throat> when I had a daytime encounter, I was in an altered state before I, know I knew I was having an encounter. It was almost technologically precise. I was walking from, one, from a neighbor's yard to my yard, and when I stepped, I was perfectly fine on this side of the line. I took a step over an invisible barrier, which immediately put me into an altered state before I even saw the, the ETs. So I felt it was very much an imposed, external, technologically produced state of mind so that when I looked up and saw the little beings there in the yard, I didn't freak. I did not act as I would have normally. My normal state of consciousness was very much dampened and it was, there was surprise, there wasn't shock and fainting. The same thing seems to happen with other people. No matter, there's a change in how you normally would react and I think it's imposed in some very external uh, technological way. For instance, one abductee who was very upset about things that had happened with him and, and had said, the next time I get my little hands around the, their little necks, I'm going to smash them in the face. I'm really mad about this. They're not going to do me this way anymore. And he had a guest, house guest staying at his house, and when the house guest was asleep in the living room on the sofa, the, the host woke up in the middle of the night for no apparent reason and looked down the hallway and saw the little blue light probe that had been in his house several times before during experiences or before the, on, the onset of one. He saw this bobbing over the head of the person who was sleeping in his living room on the couch. And he had just said, not three days before, if I ever see him again, I'm going to give him this. He looked up and said, oh, I know what that is, <coughs> out to sleep. The next morning was doubly furious. He had been thwarted in what he would have normally and naturally wished to do.
So it seems like there's an imposed state, not perhaps dream state at all. It's just something that dampens our normal response, and that's how it feels, really. And it's in the daytime, you know you're not sleeping when you're walking and talking and driving and cooking and so on. So it's not like the dream state feels. Anyone else on the panel for that one? Okay, next. I'd like to ask our esteemed panel of broad experience here a question perhaps you can't answer completely, but give us some contributions from your experience to compare and contrast the information we're putting together on abductions, meaning forced by not giving you free will, however you want to call that, versus the contact voluntarily where there's no force. What are we learning from these two? Are we getting similar data, conflicting data, and how is it coming about? Can you contrast and, and show the conflictions and contrast on this? Uh, to, to start to answer that question, I think it's important to know who comes to us. People who are coping, people who um, maybe remember things consciously or feel they are contactees may never come to us for any kind of help. So it's kind of skewed in terms of the population that we may see. Uh, we see the people who are confused, anxious, sleepless, irritable, you know, all those more traumatic responses. Um, and so they may see themselves more as abducted and terrorized or something like that, at least to start with. Um, so I, I think that that was an important distinction in terms of comparison. Um, I would like to talk to a lot of people who uh, perhaps call themselves as contactees and have maybe more positive experiences uh, just for that comparison, but uh, I think so much of what I do see comes because it comes to the uh, label of trauma, uh, at least initially. Um, I do want to add that through my research um, that I would say about 50% end up feeling positive about it and about 50% don't, even though at first they may have come for that indeed initial traumatic um, uh, release that they need to work through. Well, one of the things that I know in letters and audio cassettes people have sent me that probably the second emotion after fear is anger and uh, that there is a pattern in the people who feel that their will has been violated, that they've been raped, or there's a, a kind of a syndrome there. I think it's also interesting that there are several men that have corresponded and um, I have interviewed and talked with who you, you were talking about will and versus violation or will or those who felt like that they had consciously acquiesced to do something versus those who felt that they had no choice. Well, there is a couple of interesting twilight areas here that seems to involve both. And in men, uh, one of these patterns that I've heard over and over again is where they feel in the beginning that they're having an, a sexual encounter with a pretty blonde woman or something. And uh, they are um, happy and willfully involved in this action. And then uh, you will hear them, it's one or two versions I've heard. They suddenly, the blonde woman who they thought was, they were in a sexual relationship with, is suddenly replaced by either a gray that's floating above them because they feel no physical pressure and or they suddenly see clearly whether the phenomenon releases this or there's something that the human mind and spirit forces through this wall. They see the tubes and the machines that are hooked up to their genitals. At that moment, they feel complete and total humiliation and rage. Now, I've seen that pattern. And one man uh, just uh, three nights ago who has had this happen to him several times, uh, he called because he's been going through a, a, a ebb and flow, a vacillation between I am, I am finally getting ready to deal with them on a conscious level, I am going to break through this strange state, and he called the other night to tell me that he was uh, waked up and he knew he was totally conscious and that there was a golf ball size glowing white light in the bedroom which he saw move what he estimated to be about five feet through the air but he said that he was struck with a terror that was as deep and abiding as anything he'd ever experienced before. Well, 
just a week or so before, he had said, I am ready for conscious encounter. Now, there's something about these golf ball size, baseball size, softball size lights uh, for, I'm sure, all of us here and, and those of you out there. It is prevalent throughout the abduction literature and the experiences. And I've wondered, are they some kind of an advanced TV telephone communication system? It's come in place to make some kind of communication. And yet, I know more abductees are so terrified of these glowing light balls and the few that have relaxed into a place eventually after they've come and gone, they get some kind of communication from them. So what I'm trying to say is, is that when it comes to this issue of uh, saying I, they want an experience, the phenomenon seems to come back with something that would seem to be now up front, center, and conscious but we all still seem to have a great deal of difficulty even dealing with a ball of light. I, I would like to say about the contact and abduction uh, division that for the working purpose, I think you'd need to define what those things are. And an abduction is where someone is taken forcibly or against their will, and a contact is where you have an exchange of information where nobody is forced to do anything. It's easy to say the two things are not alike, and the same things can happen within one person's experience. Now, there are those who do think they have gone willingly once the intrusion has started, but if you remember how artificially and technologically easy it is for these people to change our moods and change our minds and change our, our even our sensory input from pain to pleasure, from fear to love, instantaneously, then we don't really know when we go by ourselves if we're going willingly or if we're going because we've been made to feel we're going willingly. So. I, I tend to say if they don't take you anywhere under any conditions, you've had a contact. If they've taken you anywhere, you've had an abduction. Because a contact is simply a talk, an exchange. Is that it? Another question? Uh, concerning government involvement or military involvement in abductions, does this not take place when the person is sort of coming out of the closet and uh, starting to uh, talk about it or get uh, therapy or something what what what's uh, when does this happen some people doesn't think it happens at all or don't think it happens at all um, in one case it happened before the person even knew there was anything and certainly hadn't come out of the closet in another case it had happened uh, before anyone except the immediate family knew so there was no coming out of the closet I don't think it has anything to do with trying to keep you from talking because for a lot of us it really pushes you to talk. Yeah, I, I would tend to agree with that too. Um, obviously, Leah, who you heard today, is the, uh, actually I think the only case that I've had that, that that, you know, there was that kind of involvement. There have been some indications in other cases, very interesting, where uh, the person who didn't know much about the phenomena would say, you know, I think something happened last night, and, and the other thing that's strange is that uh, these black helicopters were roaring through the valley this morning. They, we've never seen those before. I wonder why they're circling our house. You know, and they hadn't even explored the experience, but, you know, it gave me the feeling sometimes that uh, uh, there was some kind of surveillance. Uh, certainly when we know that satellites can read newspapers from space, uh, that some of these objects just might be tracked somehow, and they might know where they're going. In Maryland, there have been several of us involved with the investigation of a case of a woman who last June was waked up with a pulsing uh, blue light uh, coming through the shades in the bedroom. It's a very small house. I've been in this house. And uh, for some reason that's still not clear, she never opened up the shades. She did go to the doorway to see in the living room, and she could also see the light pulsing there, but she never made any aggressive action to go out of the house or anything. But the next morning, there was a 14-foot diameter circle in the front yard, which we did get soil samples from. We were able to find that there were some very strange biochemical changes, actually, in the seed and the grass. And she began to have helicopters of, we think, military nature, um, over the house on such a regular basis that a MUFON investigator went with a uh, camcorder 
videotape this. Uh, there were other uh, researchers who would be on the telephone with her, and all of a sudden, the phone, they couldn't even talk on the phone because the sound in the house was so loud. One day, uh, feeling like she was going out of her skin, she said, I'm going to forget all this. I'm going to lie down on a chair in the backyard in the sun. I'm going to make this all go away. And she was lying, feeling relaxed for the first time in a while in the sun, and she said it was like somebody leaned over her and the shadow came across her face and her head. And she opened up her eyes expecting to see her husband leaning over her. And she said approximately 10 feet above her was a helicopter. And the helicopter, she said, was all beige. And she said she couldn't see through the windows. And she was going on in these minute details about this helicopter. And I said, well, the sound must have been horrific. And she said, well, there wasn't any sound. And I said, well, there must have been, things must have been blowing. This is 10 feet above you. She said, no, it was very still. Well, that is not a helicopter, as I understand helicopters in terrestrial terms, interacting with air molecules. <laughs> so. Again, we've got this camouflage, I don't know what it is, um, where this thing was, she thought, a military helicopter. Well, interestingly enough, one of the investigators in Maryland began doing some research through a uh, congressman. And they were able to push this case, actually, to um, some agencies, and they got back a response that there was a classified national security reason for why helicopters were in that neighborhood and they would not define it. And that's as of a couple of months ago. But we don't know what more. She, she still has helicopters over the house. But I think there's an example of hearing and seeing real helicopters and then what was this thing 10 feet above her on, on uh, the back porch? Anyone else? Yeah, I'll just make a, a brief comment about this. Uh, it's a hard question to answer because it seems to be very complex. You'll have one witness over here who's having experiences with Greys, never saw a government person or helicopter their entire life of experiences. Another person that seems to be involved with a group exactly like this other woman is harassed continuously by helicopters, government people. Sometimes they're even abducted maybe by the government and, and interrogated or examined to see what the aliens were up to maybe, who knows. Uh, and then you have other cases like uh, what Bill talked about where the government and the aliens seem to be working together. What the hell does this all mean, you know? I mean, uh, are there, we have three different groups with three different motives and they just happen to look alike? You know, maybe. Uh, and when does the government get involved? Are they understaffed? Maybe they just can't handle all the abductees? Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't know. But it seems like uh, th all those kind of scenarios may be going on. Okay. Next question. You pointed out that it takes a lot of commitment and sensitivity for a therapist to work with these people. How are you going to determine who's got the qualifications? Um, I won't determine that. The abductee will determine that. Um, they will know who feels right to them. Uh, the person may have all the credentials in the world. And they can be a total jerk. And I know quite a few. <laughs> no names. Um, and then there's some who have very little training, but their heart's in the right place. They have intelligence, maturity. Uh, they have enough skills to do the right thing and uh, I applaud them. So uh, uh, I, I, I get so many calls asking for who to refer and you try to find who might be out there and then I don't know who that person is and I tell them, I says, look, this person says they're interested, you check them out, you let me know if it's a bad experience. It says, I can't guarantee. It says, you have to determine that. I think that no, it's not. No? Uh, I, I think that the um, work uh, requires some kind of a new field um, that uh, there might be mental health professionals that would be qualified to be in it, but I would not like to see it restricted to 
mental health professional. First of all, we've got more to unlearn than uh, uh, than the, uh, the people that are uh, uh, are natural to this field. Now, what, so be what I think the question that should be asked is who, what what is what are the natural gifts that people need to enter this field. I, I'm working with an assistant in Boston, uh, Pam Casey, who has had no uh, mental health training at all. She's not an abductee, and yet she's an absolute natural in working with people, knows what to say when, is open, uh, can hold affect. I think one of the qualities is the capacity to be there with a person who's undergoing extraordinarily powerful affect about a matter which is not explainable. And mental health professionals are very, it's very important. I think a lot of people go into my field uh, because they want to be able to explain the things that have troubled them in their lives. And this is, to, to, to be with mystery that is so powerful and that challenges our reality, at the same time the sensitivity that John and you are talking about it, I think it requires a, a, that we perhaps in, invent a new field which will have mental health professionals, but will have some other folks too, and then to develop training programs that are specific to this kind and, and related work. Does this one not work? Well, just one thing is that one of the things I have found is that people need somebody to listen to them without feeling any judgment and that I have just held more men and women who just began to sob and there's nothing more I can do than just hold them and yet that in itself seems to be a kind of catharsis and I've experienced that many times and there there's probably a word here that it, compassion is the area uh, and we are dealing with something that is so unknown and unpredictable, but that is one thing every one of us can give each other, is more compassion and less criticism and judgment. And if you have somebody who is trying to tell you an experience that just sounds like it is completely over the top to you, at your subtitle level, just listen. Just listen. And listen to them, let them talk it all the way out. Some nights when I feel like I am so exhausted and I want to lie down, and you get the phone call and you know it's going to be an hour at least. But somehow everybody keeps going through this kind of together. And I think that's really another important part of this in addition to what the professionals uh, have to be able to provide too. Yeah, you can't teach people compassion. There's no certification for that. That's something the person working with with the researcher will know or the investigator will know. There's also a great deal of intuition involved in this and again you can't learn it. I think there are some born people to work with this and there are some people that all the training in the world would not make competent to do so. It certainly takes dedication. Next. Um, after you get past the if this is happening questions or how this is happening questions it just kind of leaves one question left. Why is it happening? Um, out of all your research and everything, what's, what's your best guess? Why, why is this happening? I want an answer from everyone. <laughs> Next. <laughs> oh, that's the big one. Uh, geez. We, we would probably all give you a different answer on that. I mean, uh, there's so many possibilities, and you've probably heard the different theories. I really don't like to speculate. Speculate. I mean, when people ask that question, I, I will list maybe five different theories. Like, you know, it's to save us, it's to save them, it's to save the planet, it's uh, none of that, it's scientific research, it's like what we do with wildlife, on and on and on. And there's no one thing that sticks out in my mind. Uh, in fact, more recently, it seems like uh, maybe it's more spiritual related. Maybe it's some evolution of consciousness and... and um, like in 2001, the monolith appears, and then all of a sudden everybody's uh, doing new and neat different things. It's like maybe it's something like that. Uh, I don't know, and it, it gets tricky <laughs> getting into uh, all the speculation. Um, so I guess I'll pass. <laughs> Not, none of us want to deal with this question because... 
sometimes I feel like I'm in one of those rooms, you know, the dances where they have the, all the mirrors, the faceted mirrors, and the lights go around, and it, depending upon which wall you look at, and it moves, and it moves, and it moves. That's the way this whole phenomenon feels, and that means the multiple facets that go beyond uh, the human abduction it involves the mutilations, the crop circles, uh, the whole area of uh, what used to be called parapsychology, ESP, mental telepathy. There's, all of it seems in some way or another to have some relationship here. But if I had, I guess, uh, one honest uh, gut reaction to all of this, uh, I really do believe that there is something in conflict about us. And I think that there are forces uh, that are ebbing and flowing of which and around us, a lot of the time we seem to be unconscious of the ebbing and the flowing of these forces upon us. Uh, Jacques Vallée calls it a control system. Uh, I've tended to use simply the word another intelligence. I don't think it's just one. I really do feel that at least two somethings are in conflict and whether or not all of the old literature and biblical perspectives of uh, the light and the dark whatever words you want to put on it are involved something along those lines I think is inherent to the nature of what we are dealing with and that it is forcing um, it is forcing us to deal with things we don't want to deal with because of the complexities of the ebb and flow of the forces, and that's as close as I can get. <clears throat> as different as some of these experiences are, when, that I talked about earlier, other various groups having various agendas, I think that it's undoubtedly true that there is at least one group that harvests from us something, maybe more than one thing. They, we have something they want, and they come and get it. There is another, seems to be another group that tries to elevate, impart, educate, teach, and teach us in some way how to maybe resist this other thing. And I think that's the sense of conflict that comes across again and again and again. We have something one group wants, and they don't care how they get it, they get it. Another force, I won't even say group, because sometimes they are only information and not de not actually there, seems to be trying to help us find a way to be strong enough or evolved enough or in some way resisted enough to take charge of and take control of these things that are taking from us. And I, sometimes I think maybe we're the good ETs, the ones who are trying to do this. Maybe we did come down here and, and incarnate to do this sort of battle. It comes across from many abductees. That's exactly how they feel. And you begin to see that's not altogether a crazy possibility. And yet there is a group that does very much disregard anything about us spiritually. There is something at the heart of this involving our souls. Maybe they don't have them. Before, um, before we continue with the questions, we are going to end this at 11 officially. And any of you that do want to stick around and ask more questions of the researchers can do so but anyone you're free to leave at 11 and that includes anyone on the panel some would like to get some sleep tonight I think so now I think several people wanted to reply to the question that was on the floor is that right yeah uh, okay I um, a, a, a teenage girl uh, said to her a grandmother who uh, said something that was disturbing to her in a uh, publicly embarrassing way. Uh, Grandma, you missed an extraordinary opportunity to keep your mouth shut uh, in that. Uh, and I, 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 I'm not taking that advice, unfortunately. Uh, well, just one quick thought about that ultimate question. We tend to think of us and them. But one way to think, one might think about it is that there's some kind of a coming together that is a relationship and that the intelligence that's bringing us together is not ours or theirs, that the motivational structure is in some higher level or whatever and that they get something from it, maybe some kind of embodiment, some sort of biological evolution and we get something 
which is some opening of our consciousness, some kind of return to the sacred, so that, and that the whole thing is orchestrated not at our level. Uh, and that, I, maybe I'm just getting a little dotty because it's late at night here, but I, I, I really wonder if there isn't another consciousness, some kind of uh, divine consciousness that may be uh, at work here and isn't us or them, but that we are in a program not of our own making. I mean, that's the ultimate loss of control. Definitely. Yeah, I'd like to, to actually attempt to answer the question. It's my personal opinion, of course, but starting from where John just left off, this lofty place is where I'd like to start, as opposed to why this abductee or that or this contactee, why the whole thing, why the interaction going on, touching on this concept, is that uh, imagine humanity walking along the ground and coming to this fence, and we climb up on the fence, and I mean all of humanity, and we climb up on the fence, and for some reason we liked it up there. And instead of just sitting on the fence, we've built a, a grand tree house up there, and we've really entrenched ourselves on the top of this fence. And uh, maybe the reason that all of these things are happening is because somebody's saying, you're, you're not supposed to be sitting on the fence, please get off. And we're going, no, no, we like it up here. We like it up here. So some of the people went, uh, some of humanity said, okay, I'll get off, and we jumped off and went on. And uh, some of the people said, no, we're staying, we like the fence. Okay, so then enter the not-so-nice influence that says, get off the fence, and smacks you off of there. Both, both types of getting off the fence are valid. The point is, get off the fence and get moving. Get your consciousness going again and broaden yourself and understand what, what is really going on. And you can have some nasty lizard aliens drag you on board and do all kinds of rude things to you, and it might help get you off the fence. Or you can say, okay, I'll get down and go on my way. What, whatever, the, whatever the reasoning is, maybe the whole thing is, uh, uh, is uh, telling us to get, to, to get on about our way. And I, I think that 20 years ago it was really easy to be a ufologist compared to what it is now, because back then, the phenomenon was over there. It flew around, it landed once in a while, and we got excited about that. Uh, abduction phenomenon was something that was like pretty bizarre in those days. Now it is very personal. The UFO phenomenon is, pers we are all personally involved in one way or another directly with this phenomenon. We have never been able to get information directly from the source before like we do now, meaning abductees, contactees, and the researchers are right there in the middle of it as well. So it is something that we're all involved in, and we can't separate ourselves from it completely ever. <laughs>